The human species, led by white Europeans and Euro-Americans, has been on a 500-year-long planet-wide rampage of conquering, plundering, looting, exploiting, and polluting the earth, as well as killing the indigenous communities that stood in their way. But the game is up. The technical and scientific forces that created a life of unparalleled luxury, as well as unrivaled military and economic power for a small global elite, are the forces that now doom us. The capitalist quest for ceaseless expansion has become a curse, a death sentence. But even as our economic and environmental systems unravel, after the hottest year in the contiguous 48 states since record keeping began 107 years ago, we lack the vision and the courage to shut down the engines of global capitalism. There will, with this final collapse, be no new lands to exploit, no new civilizations to conquer, no new peoples to subjugate, and no new resources to plunder. Melville saw how European plundering of indigenous cultures from the 16th to the 19th centuries, coupled with the use of African slaves as a workforce to replace the natives who died, enriched Europe and the United States. The Spanish conquest of the Americas set in motion five centuries of reckless economic and environmental plunder. Karl Marx and Adam Smith attributed the huge influx of wealth from the Americas as having made possible the Industrial Revolution and modern capitalism. The Industrial Revolution equipped technologically advanced states with refined weapon systems, turning us into the most efficient killers on the planet. Our bankers, corporate boards, politicians, television personalities, and generals hold up seductive images of unrivaled wealth and power. Like Ahab and his crew, these image, images spur us towards self-annihilation. All my means are sane, Ahab says, my motive and my object mad. Melville, who had been a sailor on clipper ships and whalers, was aware that the wealth of industrialized societies was violently seized from the poor of the earth. African Americans and Native Americans for centuries had little control over their destinies. Forces of bigotry and violence kept them violently subjugated by whites. Suffering for the oppressed was tangible. Death was a constant companion, and it was only their imagination, as William Faulkner noted at the end of The Sound and the Fury, that permitted them, unlike the novel's white Compson family, to endure. The theologian James Cone captures this in his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Cone says that for oppressed blacks, the cross on which Jesus was crucified was a paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system, with the news that hope comes by way of defeat, that suffering and death do not have the last word, that the last shall be first, and the first last. Chants, work songs, spirituals, the blues, poetry, dance, and art, converged under slavery to nourish and sustain the imagination of African Americans. These were the forces that, as Ralph Ellison wrote, we had in place of freedom. The oppressed would be the first, for they often know their fate, to admit that perhaps on a rational level such a notion is absurd, but they also know that it is only through the human imagination that they survive. Goldman noted that when Andrew Undershaft, a character in George Bernard Shaw's play Major Barbara, said poverty is the worst crime of all, all the other crimes are virtues beside it. His impassioned declaration elucidated the cruelty of class warfare more effectively than Shaw's socialist tracts. The degradation of education into vocational training for the corporate state, the destruction of the arts and journalism, the hijacking of the disciplines by corporate sponsors severs us from understanding, self-actualization, and finally, transcendence. 
In aesthetic terms, the corporate state seeks to crush beauty, truth, and imagination. And this is the war waged by all totalitarian systems. The role of the artist, then, precisely is to illuminate that darkness, blaze roads through the vast forest, James Baldwin wrote, so that we will not in all our doing lose sight of its purpose, which is, after all, to make the world a more humane dwelling place. Ultimately, the artist and the revolutionary function as they function and pay whatever dues they must pay behind it because they are both possessed by a vision. They do not so much follow this vision as find themselves driven by it, wrote Baldwin. Otherwise, they could never endure, much less embrace the lives they are compelled to lead. Much of the urban poor has been crippled and in many cases broken by a rewriting of laws, especially drug laws, that has permitted courts, probation officers, parole boards, and police to randomly seize poor people of color, especially African-American men, without just cause, and lock them in cages for years. In many of our most impoverished urban centers, our internal colonies, as Malcolm X called them, mobilization will at least at first be difficult. The urban poor are in chains, and these chains are being readied for the rest of us.